Okay, so then uh, let me first uh, introduce uh, Camilla Holanti. It's really a pleasure uh, to have uh, Camilla here uh, giving a talk. Camilla got her PhD, I think in 2009 in Turku University in mathematics, stayed there for a postdoc for two years. And uh, since uh, 2011, she's at Alto University where she is now full professor doing applied algebra. And uh, she is also well known uh, in, in the coding area. There is uh, from the engineering side, a big society called the Information Theory Society has more than 10,000 members and uh, she is on the board of governor also of this society. And uh, their big yearly event uh, is the ISIT conference and uh, Camilla is co-organizing it in 2022. And as we hope in presence uh, in uh, Helsinki. So today she will tell us about uh, coding theoretic frameworks for private information retrieval. And Camilla, I look forward to your talk and I give you the microphone and shut off mine. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot Joachim and thanks for the invitation uh, for the organizers. Very nice to be here. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me all right and see my slides all right. So as Joachim said, it's a talk on coding theoretic framework for private information retrieval. And this set of slides is based on a bunch of joint works with various people who are listed here on the left uh, bottom corner. And by the way, also let me know if some part of the slide is cut or something, and then I try to do something about it. But anyway, let us start. Oh, seems my keyboard is not working. I'll switch to another one. No? Yeah, there we go. So here's a short outline. First, I give you some basic intro to what private information retrieval is. And then I go through some preliminaries on linear codes and coded storage systems. So I don't have, assume that you know much about these things in advance. So I'm also sorry if I bore some of you who actually are experts on these kind of topics already. Then I talk about the uh, PIR capacity and some conjectures. And finally, I get to the maybe main part of this talk, which is our own general star product scheme, as we call it. So it's a linear private information retrieval scheme, and it's a general. It has a lot of nice practical properties and so forth. So that's something I'll go through in a bit more detail. And then finally, some uh, open problems as well. So this uh, research on private information retrieval started already in the 90s. So by Chor, Sudan, and many other authors, I'm only listing this very first uh, reference here. There are more references in the end of the slide set. Uh, but then there was a long quiet period after that in this field. And I guess uh, that was probably because it was taught uh, quite impractical at that time. But then later when these uh, coded distributed storage systems and cloud storage became really popular, and people used, started using error correcting codes to protect your storage systems, then PIR became very popular once again. So what does it mean? So private information retrieval uh, basically refers to a scheme where a user is able to download a file or some data item from a distributed storage system. So this can be a cloud or some other kind of storage system without revealing the identity of the file that they are retrieving to the servers. So there are some servers who are holding all this data. There's a user who wants to get part of the data, but the user does not know, uh, does want these servers to know which data item they are interested in. And as said so recently, uh, this coded storage in this context has boosted this research quite a bit. And then uh, a picture, some connections with PIR to maths. And actually, I want to thank uh, Ragnar Frey Hollanti, who kindly made this picture for me last minute. So there's a lot of connections to various fields in, in mathematics. So uh, for us, maybe most importantly, of course, coding theory. So when we talk about storing information or retrieving these files that we have stored, then coding theory plays an important role. Then some algebraic geometry at least in a mild way comes into play uh, because of the kind of codes that we are using. So here we are employing some Reed-Solomon codes or generalized Reed-Solomon codes 
they are pol polynomial evaluation codes. So they are kind of a, a simple, simple variant of codes, uh, more generalized codes over curves and so forth. And we are also using SUR products in our scheme. Then there's many other things that one can uh, use and study in this context. Metroid theory, especially Ragnar and his uh, student Olga Kuznetsova have been working on this aspect. Then complexity theory, obviously information theory, when we want to talk about capacity or do some privacy proofs. And probability theory related to various distributions we assume and also related to if we want to give up on full privacy and we allow leaking of some information, then uh, partial privacy also relates to probability, probability theory. And also in other applications, not just within math, but there are very close connections to a lot of things. So for instance, um, these old topics, as maybe some of you are familiar with, of oblivious transfer, secret sharing, secure computation, for instance. Then a bit more recently, uh, locally decodable codes, locally repairable codes, uh, interference management, index coding, and very recently also secure distributed matrix multiplication that has some connections again to machine learning. So this is kind of the wider context mathematics wise and application wise. So even though the kind of basic problem of retrieving some data item privately may seem like a very specialized problem, then it still has a lot of uh, other connections as well. And so let me start also by getting some semantics right. So for instance, if we have, if we are storing some data on some servers, so we have some kind of a database and let's say it's some health data and we want to get some of this health data and we have a user who is interested in this data. So then there are various ways to achieve privacy. So for instance, what one can do is to anonymize oneself. So then of course, if nobody knows who you are, it doesn't really matter so much what you retrieve because nobody knows who was doing this stuff. But I'm not going to talk about anonymity here. Also another way of um, achieve privacy is also that you just encrypt all of your data. So then it doesn't also so much matter if somebody knows uh, which piece of data you retrieved, if, if they can't really know what, what the content of the data is. So that's uh, one way of achieving privacy in one sense. Usually we term it as security. And then what we are concerned here is the kind of privacy that we actually assume that all this data stored is public, so it's not encrypted. So the data itself is not secure. So public data, but we want to protect the user's privacy by hiding which of these files. There are numerous files in the system and whatever file the user is after, they don't want anybody to know which file was the interesting one. Simple silly example is that you want to watch uh, Pirates of the Caribbean from the Netflix, but you don't want Netflix owners to know that you were interested in this specific movie. So there's nothing secret about the movie itself, but you don't want to hide, uh, you don't want to reveal your interests to anyone. And so there are of course many reasons for that. So why do you want to protect your privacy? I guess we probably all, uh, all understand why it's important, but uh, sometimes you have to kind of justify, like why should I care? But there's a lot of um, commercial use. People are taking advantage of your data and making money with it. Uh, that's maybe not so severe, but then there are like extreme examples like North Korea maybe killing people because they Googled Coca-Cola. Anyway, so this is kind of privacy that we want to do here. And there's two variants of private information retrieval. One is the computational one. So kind of traditional crypto sense we are finding the file index from the query that the user sends to the servers is computationally hard. And then there's the information theoretic variant where the identity and the query have zero mutual information, meaning that when the servers get uh, the queries of the user, then they cannot uh, find the index i based on these queries, or at least it amounts to guessing at its best. And this is the kind of PIR we do here, so information theoretic. There's no assumptions on any limitations on the computational power of these servers. Okay, uh, then how to achieve privacy? So maybe first 
basic thing to note is that in this information theoretic sense, where we really require that the mutual information between the queries and the file index is zero, then if we only have one server who is storing all the data, then the only way to do this is to actually retrieve all the data. So basically, we need to download everything to privately get that single piece of data that we were actually interested in. And so, as you can imagine, this is very wasteful in terms of the download bandwidth. If we have some huge cloud storage system, like if you want to, this is maybe not the best of examples, but if you don't want to download some of your files privately from Google data center, you definitely don't want to download all the contents of the data center. So then how to uh, remedy this is that instead of having just one server storing all the data, we can replicate our data. So just copy it on several servers, or we can do some more elaborate coding. And I'll go to the coding a bit more uh, in a short while, but just to give a simple example. So if we assume that we have a, a database that consists of M files, and we denote these indices in the superscript, so x1 is the first file and x to the m is the mth file in the system. So then if we now uh, split these files into fragments and denote by xij, then this is the jth fragment of the ith file. So now a very basic uh, example is if we use the so-called three to simple parity check code to encode our files. Then what we do is that if we consider the ith file, so here we would split it in two pieces. So we divide it in two parts. So you can imagine this is a bit string. So we divide this into two equally long bit strings and then we encode it. So first we take the first part, then the second part, and then we take the sum of these two parts. So basically if these would be just bits, then we have the first bit, second bit, and the XOR of the first two bits. And then how we actually store our information and our files with this kind of coding. Uh, we take the gate coordinates of the encoded vectors, so the encoded files, and then we store these gate piece on the gate server. So every server is storing some piece of each file. So if we start with a toy example, so now no coding yet, so just replication. So we have three files, so M denotes the number of files, so our database X consists of these three files, X1, X2, X3. And this is not the power of X, it is just a superscript indicating the file index. And we replicate these files uh, on two servers. So we copy them on the first server and we copy them on the second server. And now if we assume the simplest possible files uh, there could be, so let us assume that they are just single bits. So the first file is the bit one, second file is also bit one, third file is bit zero. So bit stupid example, but to work, just to work as a toy example. So assume that the user wants the first file, then what do we do? So it's kind of seems a bit counterintuitive that the user is supposed to tell the servers uh, that he wants the first file without revealing them that he wants the first file. So how to do this? So what we do is that we first choose a random vector, let it be u, and assume it came out as 101, and the length of it is three, which matches with this number of files we have on each server. And then we send this vector to the first server, and we send to the second server the same vector, but we flip the bit that corresponds to the file that we want. So we add the E1 vector, the first standard basis vector, uh, to flip this first bit because we wanted the first file. And the servers project the data they hold with these query vectors that we have uploaded to the server. So basically they take the inner product between the query vector and the data vector that they are storing. And they send us back this linear combination. So the first one send us X1 plus X3, which is the bit one. And the second one sends us, uh, we sent to the uh, second server, just the vector 001. So they only send us the third bit, which is zero. And now, as you can probably already guess how we get our desired file, which was the first one, we need to just add up these two responses. So when you add x1 plus x3 plus x3, 
if we assume binary, then we get rid of the x3 part that we were not interested in, and we are just left with x1. So 1 plus 0 is 1, we got our first file. And if we are not in the binary case, then of course we can just subtract. So my minor change in that case. And so why is this private now? So we implicitly assume that these two servers, they are not talking to each other. So of course, if they exchange the queries that we send to them, then they can get precisely the same information that we, we have. So for this to be private, we need to assume that these two servers, they don't exchange their queries, uh, they don't collude as we say. Okay, so then before we go to our coded toy example, I briefly introduce what linear error correcting codes are. So we denote them by three parameters, n, k, d, min. So code c is just a k-dimensional subspace of f, q to the n. So f, q here is a finite field of q elements. So q is a power of prime. And a linear code has always a generator matrix G with which we can uh, encode any K information symbols, for instance, bits, XI into some encoded symbols, YJ. So basically we have this simple uh, encoding equation. We just multiply our information vector with the generator matrix to get our encoded data vector. So the code is the row space of this generator matrix. So it's not a unique matrix. We can have many different generator matrices and n is called the length of the code. And then one of the crucial parameters is the minimum distance. So this basically tells us um, how many coordinates of a code word can we lose and still be able to uh, recover the whole code vector. So basically it is just the number of coordinates where our code words differ. So if y and z are distinct code words, then the number of coordinates where they differ from each other is the minimum distance or the minimum of this is the minimum distance. So basically we can lose any d min minus one coordinates without actually losing any data. And for, uh, for these kind of codes, we have the singleton bound. So it says that the minimum distance can never be more than n minus k plus one. So n was the length of the code and for linear codes, k is the dimension and then plus one. So basically, if we get to this upper bound, then we call these codes maximum distance separable, MDS for short. So they have the maximum failure tolerance capability. We can lose maximal amount of coordinates without any data getting destroyed. And another property that MDS codes have is that any K uh, coded symbols are enough to recover the whole file. So if we denote uh, our fragments of files by XI, so X1 to XK, uh, then any k set will be an information set. So information set means a set uh, which is enough to recover the whole file. So it's obvious that if we have the uh, k first fragments uh, of the actual file, it is obvious that we get the whole file. But even for MDS codes, even if we get some of the parity check symbols, uh, some of the encoded symbols, even having k of them is going to be enough. Um, uh, sorry if you hear a cat meowing, I have some company here. So the dual code, uh, which I denote by C perp, is the dual vector space of the code. And if C is MDS, then also C dual is going to, MD, going to be MDS. And the dual code is going to play a crucial role in our scheme construction for this private information retrieval. So basically, um, if we take a vector from C and C, they cancel each other out. So it's just a null space, uh, simil similarly to a dual vector space in just uh, for any fields in linear algebra or any vector space. And a simple example, which I already gave in the 322 case, but more generally, if we take K information bits or information symbols more generally, and we encode them into k plus one symbols, meaning that we just add one more coordinate, which is the sum of all the actual data pieces or information pieces. So we store x1 to xk and then the sum of these coordinates. Then this is one of the simplest example of MDS codes. So you can check that it satisfies the singleton bound. Uh, so it gets to n minus k plus one but we can only tolerate one eraser 
So if we lose any of these coordinates, then adding, adding up the remaining ones will give us the missing one. But if we lose one more, then we can't recover the whole data anymore. Okay, and then a code family that's going to be again crucial for our construction is uh, Reed Solomon codes and a bit more general version of them. So here I need a vector alpha, so coordinates alpha one to alpha n, which is uh, some finite field elements and they are distinct. These we call evaluation points. Then we have some column multipliers, uh, so vi denote uh, some not necessarily distinct elements from FQ, but they have to be non-zero. So then what I call a generalized Reed solomon code, uh, GRSK alpha V is defined as all these evaluations VI times F alpha I, where F is any polynomial over FQ with degree less than K. So this will give me a code of dimension uh, K and length N. So basically we just take these polynomial evaluations as our code vectors. And if my field size is at least n, then this is going to be a well-defined MDS code, so it gets to the singleton bound. And we can have different kinds of generator matrices. I give you two of the basic ones. Uh, so one is with this kind of a power basis. So we just take our evaluation points and then take all their powers up to, up to k minus one. And then the column multipliers, the VIs are here as uh, in the end as the diagonal matrix. And the dual code is also going to be well defined uh, and we even have a nice explicit uh, description of it. So here only the multipliers will change and this is how we can compute them based on the parameters of the actual code. Then we can have a systematic form. So systematic just means that we are storing the uh, K information symbols directly without any encoding first. That's the identity matrix part. And then we have some uh, parity check or encoded linear combinations of these first K symbols in the end. And this we can do by defining FIX here with this formula. This is not very important in what's going to follow, just to give you some explicit description to have some idea in the back of your minds what kind of codes these, these are. Okay, so that brings me uh, to our coded toy example. So again, uh, we consider the same setting. We have three files, but now because I'm doing some coding, I will need uh, three servers, not just two. Assume again that we want the first file and now I divide it into two fragments. So I'm actually using this uh, three, two simple parity check code that I showed a uh, few slides back. So I divide every file into two pieces. So the superscript is the file index and the subscript is the fragment uh, index. So basically, if you look at these three boxes, three servers, so first one is storing the first piece of every file. The second server is storing the second piece of every file. And the third server is storing uh, the kind of parity check symbol of each file. So the sum of the first two symbols. So each row here is a code word in this three two parity check code. And now it works very similarly to the first example on replicated data. We choose a random uh, vector, let it be 101. Again, the number of coordinates here is the number of files we are storing. And then we send um, u plus e1 to the first server and then uh, the pure u to the second and third servers. And e1 we add to this first server now because we are interested in this uh, first piece on the first round. So our goal is to get x1, 1. And the servers also work exactly the same way as in the replicated case. So they project their data to our query vectors so they send us the uh, linear combination or the inner product with the query vector and the data they are holding. So from the first one, we get uh, x13. And from the second one, we get uh, x12 plus x32. And from the last one, we get the first sum plus the third sum. 
And now again, uh, the entry x11, so the first piece of the first file, is going to be the sum of these responses. So if you sum up all these and we assume binary, binary code, then everything else cancels out, except we will be left with this x11. And we need a second round because the file was divided in two pieces. So we are still missing this x12. So again, we choose a new random vector. Let it be 110. And now we send u plus e1 to the second server. So e1 is the standard first standard basis vector, 0, 1, 1. And then we send our random vector to the other two servers. And again, they project off their data to our query vectors and send us their respective responses. And again, if you stare at this, you notice that everything cancels out. We are left with the second piece of the first file. And again, why is this private? We need to assume that these servers don't talk to each other, so they don't collude. So then we have privacy because everybody is just getting a random bit vector. It doesn't matter that we added E1 because they don't know what vector we have chosen to uh, begin with. So this is uh, equally random as our initial vector. Okay, but then this is of course a lot to assume that the servers would not talk to each other. They would not exchange any information. So what we then can assume that they are honest but curious. So they do their best to find out what the queries were, and some of them might actually collude and try to find out by combining all the queries what the user is after. So this is what we refer to as uh, colluding. And so formally we define a PIR scheme to protect against the colluding set J, which is a subset of our N servers. If there is a probability distribution QJ mu J, so QJ is some uh, set, and mu j is some probability measure such that for any uh, index i among our file indices, one to m, if we project uh, our query qi with measure qi to this colluding set, then we see this whole probability space. So basically, if you look at all the set of queries that the servers get, and we just look at the part that these t colluding, or sorry, whatever number of colluding servers we might have, uh, C, then it doesn't depend on the file index that was uh, requested. They see the whole, whole probability space, basically. So you can just think of uniformly distributed if you don't like probability theory. And a simpler definition, we just call a scheme a TPIR scheme if it protects any colluding set of size at most T. So this is kind of a pessimistic assumption or depending maybe how big we choose uh, T to be. So if we allow any set of servers of size at most t to collude, and we can still retrieve our file privately, then we call this a TPIR scheme. And then how do we measure how good such a scheme is? Is basically by uh, what we call a PIR rate. So the rate of a scheme is defined as the size of the desired file. So how much we kind of uh, want to download, so what is the information that we want, divided by the size of the total download that we need to do to read this, retrieve this file privately. So if you forget about the privacy assumption, then we can just basically download the uh, pure file. So then this rate would be one. So this is always upper bounded by one. The, if we want privacy, then we need to download some extra data to hide what we actually want. And as usual, the capacity of a PIR scheme or, the, or a PIR model is the maximum possible rate uh, that we can possibly achieve. And one more definition, uh, we call a scheme asymptotically capacity achieving if it has a rate that uh, converges to the capacity when the number of files goes to infinity. And so there's a lot already known about this PIR capacity. So for instance, we know what it is for replicated data. We know what it is for MDS coded uh, data. We know what it is when some of the servers collude. Uh, we know what it is uh, for single server PIR if we have site information, what it is for symmetric PIR and many, many other, 
other settings. It's already known. And what is meant by symmetric here is kind of a, a server privacy part of the story. So previously we just talked about user privacy so that the servers don't learn anything about the user's request. But when we have a symmetric scheme, that means that the user also doesn't learn anything extra. So if they want the file I, then that's precisely what they are going to get. So they won't learn any pieces of any other, other files that the servers are storing. Also, it has been shown that this uh, having an MDS code is not necessary to achieve this MDS capacity. So the capacity that MDS codes can achieve can also be achieved by some codes that are not MDS. And just to give you a bit of a flavor, how one goes about proving these kind of things, um, I go through just vaguely on a very high level, the constructive part of the capacity result for replicated storage. So if I'm storing M files on N servers and I'm just replicating them, so all the N servers are storing all the M files, no coding, nothing, just replication. Then uh, the capacity is given by this expression here, and you can see that it's a series. So if m goes to infinity, this will converge to 1 minus 1 over n. So basically, the more servers I have, the closer I can get to 1. So if I have many, many servers, then essentially there's no penalty for getting this privacy into the system except storage space, of course. But in the rate, there's no, no penalty. And so usually this kind of uh, capacity proofs here consist of two parts. So we have an information theoretic part, and I will leave that out because this is an algebraic geometry seminar. So I won't go through the information theoretic part. So what is maybe more interesting is then that do we have a scheme that actually achieve this um, capacity bound? So I will show you a small example uh, that achieve this capacity bound. And then you can hopefully believe that it can be generalized. And in the coded case, it's actually not that much different. So let us have an example of an achievable scheme for this kind of replicated capacity. So assume we have two files, A and B, and we store them on two servers via replication. And to this end, I'm going to split my files into four uh, sub-symbols. So note that I have some restriction then also on the field size so that I can actually split my symbols of files. So I split A into A1, A2, A3, A4, and I split B into B1, B2, B3, B4. And now let us assume that user wants the file A. So now my retrieval strategy to achieve this capacity would be as follows. So first I download A1 from the first server. Then I need to kind of symmetrize so I'm not obvious in what I want. So I also ask the second server for a piece of A. Then I symmetrize over files because I don't want to be obvious about wanting to file A. So I also ask for pieces uh, of the second file that I wasn't interested in. And then to be able to get what I want in the end, I also need to ask for some linear combinations of these previous things. So I can ask, for instance, for these six things from servers one and two. And then, of course, I will randomize my indices uh, so that I can be uh, more random looking over time when I retrieve things many times. So I permute these indices uh, before I actually do these queries. And now if you look at the rate of this system uh, to get my file A, so I need to get A1 that's here. A2 I can get from here because I can cancel out B3. A3 is here. A4 is here because I can cancel out B1. And now if you look at just one server, so we assume that these servers don't collude. They don't tell each other what kind of queries they have received. Now you've been asked for piece of A, piece of B, and then a combination of symbols from both files. So you have no clue what the user was actually after. So to get these four pieces of uh, the wanted file, we need to download these six uh, symbols. So the rate is two thirds and that gets to the bound on the previous page. So we achieve capacity by doing this. And you can 
uh, generalize this to any number of files and any number of servers. Downside is that this is really just a theoretical scheme in the sense that you will need to split every file into n to the m symbols. And if you think of some modern cloud storage systems, then how many files might you have there? That's quite many. So this is a huge, huge number, which again means that maybe you need to have a huge field size to be, be able to do this. OK, uh, so then what we don't know yet is that uh, when we actually combine this coding and colluding, then we don't know what the general capacity is, but there are some conjectures by uh, our group. So the first one um, conjectures that the asymptotic capacity uh, for an NK MDS storage code, when we have T collusion, B Byzantine servers, so meaning that they might send you actually erroneous responses and possibly are unresponsive servers who don't send you anything as a response, then the rate we can achieve is at most this expression here. And the second conjecture gives you exactly the same uh, expression, but it's the capacity for symmetric PIR, so where we also have the server privacy. So these are uh, some of the con uh, conjectures we have laid out and actually uh, we have proven these asymptotic capacities in some special cases. I will get to that a bit later. So then a bit older conjecture that we have made is this one. So if we assume an NKD uh, code and consider a distributed storage system with M files and T has to be between one and N minus K, then the rate that any TBIR scheme can have is at most this one. And basically, this is a variant of what you saw on the previous slide. We just don't have the Byzantine and unresponsive servers here. But we also have this finite version here. So if we have M files, uh, we claimed that this is the capacity. And then the asymptotic uh, expression you get from here is this one. So this coincides to the asymptotic expression on the previous slide without the B and, B and R. But unfortunately, um, C.H. Jafar and uh, his student, they have proven that in the case when we have two collusion and two files and four servers, then this is actually not the best rate that you can achieve. So here, what we would get uh, with our conjecture is four over seven, whereas they showed that you can get to three over five, which is a bigger, bigger retrieval rate. So this in its full generality, as we assumed it, uh, is not true, at least not for two files. However, <clears throat> we still believe that this asymptotic uh, expression is true. So we still maintain this conjecture that the asymptotic rate is or asymptotic capacity is what is here on the right hand side. And we have also proven that in the finite case, the left hand side holds, but we have needed some additional technical assumptions that this counter example does not satisfy. So it's not the fully general capacity, unfortunately. So we have proven a uh, bunch of these conjectures for so-called strongly linear schemes. I will explain a bit later what they are. And then we have a bit more general proof. But at the moment, we are not actually exactly sure what our technical assumptions there are. We are working on it at the moment. So then just to maybe a little bit, um, so I showed you some of these capacity results, but um, here is maybe something that's easier to uh, grasp. So on the left-hand side, we have the asymptotic capacities for different cases, and on the right-hand side for the symmetric uh, PIR. So all the expressions coincide. K, N are the code parameters, so N servers, N, K code. T is number of colluding servers who may exchange queries. B is the number of Byzantine servers who can send you errors, erroneous responses. And R is the number of possibly unresponsive servers. So these uh, red ones are in their most general form still open conjectures, except uh, this right hand side. This we have proven uh, in our recent, recent work. And maybe to say a word about the 
why we basically only care about the asymptot asymptotic capacity. So I don't know if there are any people who are working on, for instance, wireless communications. In that context, when we talk about capacity, usually it's something theoretical that we hardly ever achieve, and it's kind of of theoretical interest mainly. But here it's kind of the opposite. So the asymptotic rate is what will practically happen all the time. So meaning that we converge very quickly to the asymptotic expression. So it is asymptotic um, and exponentially decreasing in the number of files, which is going to be a huge number normally. So we can see that already when we have very few files, less than 10, we are essentially going down to the asymptotic expression. So this is a curve where we have no coding, so it's just replication and we have some collusion. And same happens the other way around. If we have coded storage, no collusion, then again, the finite capacity very quickly converges to the asymptotic capacity. Still, of course, uh, for theory's sake, it would be nice to be able to prove the general capacity for also finite number of files. Just checking what time it is, okay. Um, so then I'm getting to our scheme and hopefully I have time to go uh, through it. And by the way, I forgot to say in the beginning that don't worry that I have 50 slide, uh, slides. Uh, there's not that many actual slide, slides. There's a bunch of ref references and other stuff in the end. So it's not as horrendous as it looks like. So what we did in this uh, paper, uh, suitably published in Siam Journal of Applied Algebra and Geometry was that we proposed a fully general coded uh, retrieval scheme that protect, protects against T collusion, so any T servers might collude. And what is nice about this scheme is that it's asymptotically capacity achieving in the known points. So when there's no coding and there is collusion or the other way around, when we use it with MDS uh, generalized Reed Solomon codes, and also for all the uh, conjectures, it will achieve the capacity that is conjectured. And so what is so different about this than the, some of the previous schemes is that now what we do is that our queries actually also come from a code. So not only storage is via MDS code, but also the query scheme is by some other code D. So in like our two examples, we were choosing um, N queries from the entire space over the finite field. But what we do now is that we actually choose um, M queries of length N. So they come from this code and so kind of a nice interplay between the storage and query code is allowing us to protect against T collusion. We can design this for any parameters N, K and T basically. And the scheme is strongly linear and I will soon tell you in more technical details what that means. And we can also show that uh, there's no other strongly linear scheme that could be essentially better than our star product scheme. So it's kind of a, let's say, universally good scheme. So then what we also proved recently, like I already briefly mentioned, um, we have closed some of those gaps in the capacity results that I showed in the table. Uh, for instance, we got the symmetric PIR capacity for coded colluding Byzantine and unresponsive servers in the symmetric case. And by using this notion of strongly linearity, then we have the capacity for these kind of schemes uh, for any any number of files M. And also for all these conjectures that we have uh, stated earlier, we can also prove them under the strong linearity assumption. And as I also mentioned, uh, we also thought, actually first thought we proved the fully general case, but then realized that we need some uh, technical assumption and let us hopefully find out in the near future what that is and what effects it will have. So strong linearity um, means that when we decode our file from all the responses, we can do that uh, by using a deterministic linear function over FQ of the response vector, which does not depend on the randomness used to produce these queries. And this is important in practice because it allows small field sizes and low uh, fragmentation of the file. And now it's just, uh, quickly show you what the star product scheme is. And I won't go through all the details because I see that I'm a bit running out of time, unfortunately. 
So the star product, also called Shur or Hadamard product, it's just the kind of product of vectors that you are told in the school not to do. So you just take the component wise product and the star product code is then the linear span of all these vectors. And we have something similar to the singleton bound also in this case that will help us to optimize our star product scheme. So here we do everything in the same way. So we split our files into K pieces, M of them, encode them with the generator matrix. So we store these pieces then over N servers. So this is precisely the same uh, with the toy examples. And then now what is a bit different is that uh, we want to retrieve a file and we need to add this kind of indicator vector to the file that we wanted to get. So basically, again, a simple example would be with the simple parity check code. Now, if we would use an indicator vector 101, then what we get by taking this star product of the responses and the query vector is A0, A plus B. And now it's obvious to you how we can get either A or B out of this. So we can recover our file. And so more generally, we choose this E uh, to have such a support that it covers an information set. So then by the code properties, we know that we are able to decode our desired file. And to hide this uh, E vector that reveals what we want, we use a retrieval code D. So the response vector then essentially, when the server send us back the linear combinations is just the star product part and then the actual interesting part that we would like to decode. And how do we get our information is that we just project off uh, this C star D part by using the dual code. And then we are left with this part and we can decode our information from there. And so how much can we download? I will skip the details, but based on this uh, generalized singleton bound, we can actually compute that if we use generalized three Solomon code, so we know that we get to the bound, then we will be able to get uh, n minus k minus t plus one symbols by doing, doing this uh, retrieval scheme by using this query code. So as we can see, the rate is what we have conjectured to be the optimal, optimal capacity in the asymptotic case. And then we show again, I won't go into de details, but I just uh, tell you that if we have such a strongly linear scheme, so where our reconstruction function is a deterministic function, doesn't depend on the queries, uh, query realization, then also we get to this upper bound and there's no uh, strongly linear scheme that could be better than the star product scheme. And let me just finish already a bit over time, sorry for that, finish by uh, mentioning that we have then extended these works to many other settings. If you want to take a look, you can look at archive search with uh, our my and my co-authors names and you can find a bunch of recent papers on various PIR settings. Most recently we added also quantum communication to this set. Okay, so then uh, as said, privacy is a big concern and recently from coded storage has gained a lot, a lot of interest both within academia and industry. And we have designed this general algebraic scheme protecting against T collusion that we call star product scheme. And then we have generalized this to a bunch of various settings and closed some gaps in the capacity results. And this strong linearity uh, is really nice in practice because it allows us to construct everything over small fields and to have low sub packetization. So when we split our file further, we don't have to split it in so many pieces. And then some open problems. Uh, there's still some impracticalities. When we have a lot of files, the servers are computing these huge linear combinations. So that's maybe a bit problematic, at least if the code is not binary. Then parcel privacy is another interesting topic. And still this fully general coded, colluded, capacity is an open question, but we, we are hoping to settle that in, in the near future. Let's see what happens. Then a bunch of references also won't go through in detail, but I guess this will be online and you can uh, see them in a bit more time on your own if you like. 
Then finally, apologies for going a bit over time and thank you very much. Very happy to answer questions or discuss further. So thanks a lot, uh, Camilla, for this very inspiring uh, overview talk of private information retrieval. Uh, let me go to the question answer is uh, one question is in uh, the file from Elisa Gola, yeah. and uh, she said how realistic is it uh, that uh, the servers do not communicate and uh, I mean you gave a partial answer if they partially only can communicate uh, the, it, it doesn't work but uh, for example Elisa mentions Netflix where one conceivably can assume uh, that uh, they can control all the servers and might still. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you have an answer to that. Yes. Yeah, so Netflix or Google data center, they are of course not the best, uh, best examples because of this very fact that it's hard to guarantee that they would, they wouldn't be any servers colluding. Maybe a more realistic setting is, uh, for instance, some peer-to-peer -peer networks, like, I don't know, NewTorrent, for instance. I haven't been really using such networks myself, mm -hmm. but there we would have some natural user communities. So we could maybe make some assumptions that maybe this group of users might collude together, and then this other group of users might collude together, but it's unlikely that these two different groups would collude amongst themselves. So everybody there would be interested in their privacy and they would adhere to certain rules, maybe risking being kicked out if they are caught or so sometimes these privacy um, requirements can also of course be just enforced by some regulation. For, in for instance, all telephone operators, they can tell precisely where I am, but they don't do that because it's prevented by law. But then, of course, if we dictate it by law, then we don't really need private information retrieval anymore because there's a law that prevents from using this information. But I, I like this peer-to-peer -peer network as maybe more realistic uh, example than these huge data centers. Thanks, yeah. So then I get also a question from Lyubomir Borisov. I think he's from Bulgarian Academy of Science, and uh, he would uh, ask, uh, you know, if the talk and the references, etc., the material, uh, would it, would it be available somewhere? Um, so this recording will go online, but I'm not sure. Will it also have the slides set separately? If one doesn't want to watch the video, but just look at the slides, how does that work? So far, we have not uploaded the slides on the web page, but I mean, we could do it if you want to, or I guess otherwise everyone can also send you a Yeah, please, I would say please just slides. email me and I'm very happy to share my slides. Maybe always a bit uh, reluctant to put them online because of uh, then I would like to check that all my references are up to date and appropriate. Uh, exactly. Always uh, miss, missing something most likely and so yeah, happy to share, but maybe preferably by private email, mm -hmm. if that's all right. Maybe uh, just a general comment. Uh, we are here in Siam working group, you know, uh, applications of uh, algebra, algebraic geometry. The main paper you mentioned, which got published in Siam, is I think pretty much the highest uh, cited paper uh, in our new journal. Uh, I just looked in Google Scholar has now over 150 citations. <laughs> yeah, it's, and, uh, it has become popular. That's yes. very nice, actually. Yeah. But uh, one thing is, you know, I saw that uh, there might be quite a few audience which do not know coding or crypto and are just algebraized by background of various forms of applied algebra. Would you, could you suggest, you know, some subtopics where these people could enter? The field without uh, learning a whole baggage of uh, coding theory or whatever? Um, yeah, so I guess to this PIR, for instance, well, like I, on these slides, I gave just, I don't know, two, three slides of background in coding theory, which is basically sufficient. Of, of course, to get like a good intuition, then maybe look at some coding theory lecture notes, um, first 10, 20 pages to get a bit bigger overview, but I guess there's a bunch of good slides. Actually, there are some really nice YouTube videos by various authors. If you Google, I don't know, Hamming Distance or Read Solomon Code, you can find a lot of nice, uh, nice short videos as well, if you want to get like a very brief, brief intro. 
then another thing is, uh, you know, you mentioned this Shua Hadamar product. And this is kind of also in the center of, of code-based cryptography. Yeah. Because uh, this, uh, the Shua Square has low dimensions. Yeah. When you start with uh, algebraic geometric code or with uh, right. generalized Reed Solomon code. Is, yeah. is this here also relevant since you also work with yes. Reed Solomon codes? So. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of, it is very relevant, but it is um, the goal is opposite. So in so the kind of codes that we use here, they would really not qualify for code-based crypto because you would be able to distinguish by this uh, lower rank of the shoe product. So we want to kind of uh, minimize minimize the rank of the shoe shoe product of two codes. Whereas in code-based crypto, I guess you want to maximize it, not to distinguish from a random Exactly, so to avoid code. any distinguisher. <laughs> yeah. Well, so are there any other questions then from the audience uh, or from the panelists and comments? Then we are right in the hour. It's uh, two to six. <laughs> okay, glad. Cool. And sorry again thank for going then, over time. Yeah, yeah, no, I thank you again uh, for the really uh, nicely presented talk. Thank you very much. And thanks also for the audience. Unfortunately, I didn't really see the list of participants because I was on full screen. So I have no idea who were, who were there. But yeah, yeah, anyway, thanks know, everyone for uh, listening. You know, uh, maintain the list. But uh, I, I recognize quite a few names. <laughs> so yeah. We were about close to 50 uh, at the peak. So. Okay, cool. And so for everyone who wants to stay again, we can have like a inf more informal discussion um, where we can, where other people can also unmute themselves. Like, I'm not sure if you still have time, Camilla, since it's not 6 yeah, p.m. Yeah, so I uh, have some time, definitely. Uh, if you want to say that.